Good morning. My name is Heather Gladhart. I'm the principal here at Coleman Elementary School, and we'd like to welcome you as we kick off the 22-23 school year. We're really excited for the opportunities that this school year will provide for not only our students and staff, but also our community, and we look forward to a fantastic year. To get started this morning, we are gonna have Dr. Gabe Edgar, Superintendent of Schools. Thank you, Heather. Well, first of all, I'd just like to take the opportunity to uh, say thank you uh, to the community uh, for the passage of the, the, the levy extension by 71%. That shows that there's a lot of, uh, you know, trust in, in what we're doing in St. Joe Public Schools. And one thing that I would tell you um, is there's a lot of excitement in the air, and you're going to hear over the next couple of minutes um, some of those points that are coming across as excitement. Um, we uh, last week we welcomed our new teachers back or I guess two weeks ago uh, we welcomed our administrators back um, had a great meeting everything went well uh, then last week we had our new teachers in um, and everything went extremely well and this week we're excited uh, that tomorrow the the teachers will be back and and uh, all staff uh, will be back in the buildings and uh, next Monday uh, while we're all the reason why we are all here is uh, we welcome the students back in 22-23. So like I mentioned, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ashley McGinnis now, and she's going to talk a little bit about academics. Can I take this off of here, John? Yeah. It might be easier for me. Okay. I am Ashley McGinnis. I am the Assistant Superintendent of Academic Services. Teaching and learning for the upcoming school year will be focused on getting back to the basics of effective instructional practices. We refer to this as tier one instructional practices. So what does this look like in the classroom? It means routines and procedures are in place. Students know the expectations and they know what happens if you don't meet the expectations. And differentiated instruction to meet each student's learning needs. That could be whole group, small group, one-on-one -on -one instruction, stations or projects. Teachers and students need to be clear about the learning objective for the day. Strong student-teacher relationships exist. Instruction must be engaging, meaningful, and relevant to students' lives. Kids today do not respond well with the sit and get approach to learning, so we really have to mix it up to keep students interested. Establishing a positive and safe classroom learning environment sets the stage for learning. Our professional development for teachers and staff this year will not only focus on relationships, but also on students knowing what they are learning and why they are learning it. Last year, our teachers and instructional leaders updated our math curriculum, which resulted in academic achievement gains. This year, we are implementing updated ELA curriculum, and we're hopeful for another positive impact in learning. We're excited to partner with local businesses and community volunteers for some specific needs we have in our school buildings. With the support from Pizza Ranch, all elementary schools will be participating in a reading rodeo program where students can earn a free pizza by achieving a specific reading goal. We're also piloting a mentoring program in some of our schools to provide our students with positive and encouraging role models. That will be our teaching and learning focus for the upcoming school year. There's a lot of positive energy and momentum in our district right now. I'm looking forward to supporting our staff and students and moving our district forward by really getting back to the basics of high impact instructional strategies. Of course, to educate kids, we have to have them present at school. Dr. Lau will be addressing the importance of attendance. Um, as Dr. McGinnis said, uh, I'm Kendra Lau and Director of School Improvement. Uh, the St. Joseph School District launched an attendance comeback plan in January of 2022. Attendance had fallen to record lows and we needed to act. Our attendance had improved by May by almost 5%, but yet we have a lot of work to do. Nationwide, 8 million students are chronically absent, and that was before the pandemic. Now, that number has doubled. 
Last year, our students missed, on average, nine weeks of school. Even worse, some of our kindergartners missed half the year. Chronic absenteeism is defined as missing as little as two days a month. Our students are missing about a week a month. In a general sense, it seems most of us can understand the concept of fairness. We seem to easily recognize when something isn't fair. And it's not fair that our kids aren't in school. So if we are worried about our kids getting a fair shake at a good life, we need to get them in school. The pandemic wasn't fair. It hit us hard. It hit the nation hard. But the pain of the pandemic and our past has to become the promise of our future. With 64% of our students saying they are stuck and discouraged, it will take all of us to return hope to our kids and our community. And that's why the St. Joe School District has a comeback plan. Each building has a plan. Attendance interventionists are being hired. More social workers are coming on board. And the St. Joseph school teachers are returning this week to design engaging lessons and connect with kids. We will visit homes, we will call families, and we will encourage attendance improvements. And we will continue to say, as we always have, stay home when you are sick. Together, we can make a difference in each student's life. And it starts with making sure that they are in school. And now Dr. Er, Mr. Nolte will talk to you about safety and security. Thank you, as, as uh, Kendra said, uh, I'm Mr. Shannon Nolte. I'm the new Director of Safety and Security, uh, Non-Academic Student Services in the St. Joseph School District. Um, and as I've said over the past few weeks, as I've gotten to talk to people, um, you know, obviously safety and security is our number one priority. It supports the teaching and learning that has been talked about here today, uh, supports those in attendance, and that has to be our number one priority, and it is. In, in that effort, over the past several years, there's been many updates to the entrances of buildings. Um, the last three were the three high schools that have been finished this summer. If you enter one of those high schools, you'll, you'll notice a difference. And the whole design around those is the safety and security of the staff and the students. Um, as we go through more of those things, we've updated, we are updating more camera systems in elementary schools this year. We are updating, we've done that a lot in all the other middle schools, high schools, and some of the elementaries. Uh, again, it's an investment that we take seriously uh, because it is a number one priority. Another thing that we've talked about is a newly designed and we're going to implement some updated safety protocols as far as intruder training goes. Working with the SROs that we have in the district and the St. Joe Police Department, we're designing some um, training for our staff in each of the buildings to make sure that when, when these situations come up, they are prepared and they're willing to respond appropriately and safely. And lastly, I, I just make a comment that we are renewing some collaboration with the city and county emergency management associations. Um, we'll be attending those meetings regularly. We will have them sitting on our safety committee uh, within our district and we'll collaborate with those folks to make sure if in the case of emergency that things are conducted safely and securely and, and responded appropriately. Um, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Mrs. Mrs. Uh, Tammy smith Hinchy to talk about health and wellness. Thank you. Hello. I'm Tammy smith Hinchy. I am the Health Services Coordinator for the St. Joseph School District. I wanted to talk a little bit about how the importance of immunizations are to your child. Immunization is the single most important way that parents can protect their children against serious disease. Missouri law requires that students receive their immunizations to be able to come to school. Currently, we are not requiring the COVID immunization. Those age groups that you need to be aware of are before kindergarten, eighth grade, and seniors in high school. This week is a great time to reach out to your healthcare provider to find out if your child is up to date. It's very important before the first day of school to make sure those immunizations are up to date. 
You can also reach out to the St. Joseph Health Department. As far as COVID guidelines go, any student that is positive for COVID-19 will need to stay out of school for five days. They can return on day six if they've been fever free without the use of medications and their symptoms are, com are starting to dis dissipate. Um, we will need proof of a positive test. Students may complete their learning tasks and assignments at home, and this will help with their attendance. SJSD is not currently contact tracing or quarantining students for exposure to COVID-19. However, we are going to do our best to notify you if your child has been a close contact. We ask that you monitor your student for symptoms, including sore throat, fever, headache, cough, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, loss of taste and smell, and body aches. If you develop two or more of these symptoms, we ask that you see your healthcare provider for their guidance. The health and safety of our students is vital of importance to their education. Please do your best to prevent illness by covering your cough, washing your hands, and stay home if you're sick. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Eileen Houston Stewart and I'm the Director of Communications for the District. Uh, as we begin a new school year, we want our parents and our community to know that we are committed to communicating with them during the school year with information that is accurate and timely. During the summer, our staff de developed a communications plan for our employees and one for the public. And you'll be hearing from the district more often. We'll be asking your opinion on topics. We want to interact with you face to face through focus groups and town hall meetings, for example. You will see more stories in the news about our district, its employees and the students in the news on our website and on social media platforms. We want to connect with our public so that they can learn more about what's taking place in our classrooms and how we are preparing students for the future. The input is important to us and we want to hear your suggestions and what can be improved and your ideas on various topics that we will go through um, through the school year. You might remember that we started the Vision Forward process in the fall last year, and if you're not familiar, Vision Forward involves a group of St. Joe citizens who have come together to develop a long-range plan for our school district. The committee and our community are writing a plan that we hope will improve our school district. So we invite people to come to our next Vision Forward meeting. It's on September 20th at 6 p.m. at Word of Life Church. And we were really picking up where we left off last spring, but it's not too late for people to get involved and to give their input. The Vision Forward engagement team and the public will write that action plan and they will take the school district, that will take the school district in the future and make it better for our students and staff. We will have meetings in September and October to finish the plan and then the document will be submitted to the Board of Education in December. We are very excited about this upcoming school year and we ask that our parents and community come join with us, partner with us as we approach a new school, a new school year. And so at this time, I'd like to turn it back over to Dr. Edgar for closing remarks and any questions that the media might have. Thank you, Eileen. Well, one, one word that everyone has heard from me since day one, I talked a little bit about the new teachers, I talked about the administrators, I talked about the teachers coming back. One word that I would sum everything up in is consistency. That's something that they hear every Monday morning from me. We're going to become more consistent. And the consistent message for 22-23 is going to be make a difference. Because there's one thing in education that every single one of us can do. Every person from food service to top administration to custodial staff to bus drivers, if you can't wake up the next day and say, ask yourself if you made a difference, and if you answer that no, you're in the wrong profession. If you answer, answer it yes, then you're in the right profession, and that's who we want to be in 22-23. So let's go make a difference. So at this time, I would entertain any questions that you guys might have.
how would that affect if they decided not to come into school like attendance was? Tammy. Would that affect attendance as well? Tammy. She's Tammy. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? So, for attendance wise, you guys said you're still going to contact those for better and close contact for COVID. What would happen if they don't come into school? Would you still recommend them to come into school or if they decide to stay home? I guess just how does that look? We want everyone to be in school and we will not be able to contact every single person. Um, especially in the high school setting, as kids are going from class to class. We, um, if a positive student does show up, um, we may not be able to track every single person because we are not contact tracing, and that is per the new CDC guidelines. So we do want kids to be in school, especially if they're well. On that matter, um, you know, is there, is there a situation in which maybe a student is, is expressing symptoms, um, you know, but they say they don't think they have COVID, parents, parents don't report any COVID positive situation, what happens then? If, if a teacher simply observes a student seems to be active symptomatic, what is the practice going to be? If a student doesn't, is not sick and is fever free, they will stay in school. Yes. What else is needed safety-wise in the buildings? Any other cameras, any other entrances, SR, more SROs needed? What are some other things that are still needed? Um, well, obviously, we're, uh, we're continuing to analyze that, and, and there's always ways we can improve. Like I said, there are elementary schools, some elementary schools that will re be receiving updated camera systems this year. That'll be the last round of the updated camera systems. We will always work with administrators to see if there are different um, cameras or views or whatever that we need to adjust. Um, so the, but with the last round of those cameras will be put, put into place this year, and that's one thing that can be done. You mentioned the SROs. We have six SROs that are uh, provided by the uh, St. Joe Police Department. We have one supervisor who, who flexes to ed wherever is needed. Um, we could, we, when we initially entered into this partnership, there was up to, we could have up to nine SROs. Uh, due to some staffing issues and things like that, the police department has not been able to fill those other positions, but we would look to um, add those positions and, and add those people in our schools. So that would maybe an area, an area of interest that we'd like to expand to, but again, it'll depend upon the, the, the folks that can uh, be hired by the St. Joe Police Department in that aspect. Um, as far as the entrances go, um, now since we've completed the three high schools, all entrances have been analyzed and, and updated as far as a secure entrance. One entry into the office, they're not, go they're not going into any other part of the school initially. So after this, uh, these three high schools have been updated, they are all up to date currently. What, uh, what, what is the, the current practice as far as on our, uh, obviously the, the building is locked to the, to the outside from, from routine access and with those new entrances it's not easy to get into the building just you know by yourself but right. individual classrooms are those locked during the day yes they are all locked and there will be continued uh, we will continue to stress that we will want maintenance custodial administration and even myself and and other uh, we will always analyze to make sure they're locked we, we want to check those um, there are several buildings that have classroom doors um, all of them are locked there's really no way to get in um, without you know without any kind of passcode entry or any even keys um, so we will stress to teachers, to administrators, to staff, please make sure you're checking those. If there needs to be repair to any of them, we will repair them immediately, get them fixed so that we, we don't have any of those issues of entrances uh, anywhere else in those buildings. Okay, and what, what, would, what would the, uh, like I mean, you know, what would the practice be in, in like just hypothetically somebody pops open the door? You know, what, how is that dealt with? Well, you know, obviously we'll, we'll work with those and, and, and stress to those folks the, the need of the safety and security. Um, you know, if it becomes a, a continual thing, we'll ask our administrators to have conversations and deal with those in a different way. But I think really, you know, a lot of times our, our teachers are here for kids um, and they want kids, to, they want kids to be safe. So if we just continue to reinforce and uh, reiterate that safety is a top priority to keep those doors closed, I think they're going to be. They're going to do that, um, uh, and, and there's not much more 
that will need to happen after that. Well, I, I, you know, this being, I just started this role here in July, but I will tell you that the administrators, the, the folk, the, uh, Dr. Seegers, who was in this position before, and the building administrators, I think feel very confident that we are uh, a much more secure campus in every location than we were even a few years ago, even five years ago. So I think we feel good. We understand that we, you know, there's always things that we need to analyze and improve upon, but I think we have a really good feeling going into this year. It's about the consistent message, you know, that I just talked about. One, one thing we have to be better at is we have to be more consistent. So if everybody's flowing from top to bottom on the same page, then that's that's how you increase security. That's how you uh, address discipline problems. That's how you create good attendance. We just have to be more consistent. Yeah, I've got questions for uh, Dr. Gibbs about uh, attendance. Sure. It would be loud. Oh, would we, we talk about? I'm sorry. I'm sure. Yeah. We can tag team that. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Whoever, whoever wants to talk. Sorry. All right. We'll let it go. All right. So, um, can you just get uh, Dr. Begins, Can you just give us a uh, uh, another overview of, of uh, the current attendance situation as it is right now? Um, like, you know, coming, coming, like at the end, I guess it would be the last day of the last of last year. Where were we in terms of talking number wise? Yeah. I'm going to hand that over to Dr. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can tell you it's not good. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Where we ended in uh, May was 74% attendance, almost 75% attendance. And so if you look at that through the lens of where we were in 2019, the 2018-19 school year, we were almost at 91%. And so we had our, some of our high schools were even at 90%. And before we really started focusing on attendance, uh, as, as we learn more about chronic absenteeism and how negative it, negative it is um, on students' outcomes and futures, uh, we had high schools at 60%. So we made tremendous gains. And so when we look at being, you know, at the end of 2022 at 74%, that is, that is difficult to see that impact. But yet, we've climbed this hill before, and we know that we can do it again. And is it, is it correct that, that, you know, your goal is basically, oh, obviously you want, your, want it to be as high as possible. Yes. But, but the kind of ideal, so to speak, would be 90% of students attending 90% of the time. Right. That is the ideal, but at the same time, we have to be reasonable. And so being reasonable within the context of a year, shooting for an 11% gain, 85% is, is what, where we have post, you know, posted our flagpole. Now, do I think we could do better than that? Yes, but can I anticipate all the variables that may come our way this year? No. And so that, that is why we have said we are going to stand firm on an 11% increase in one year. And then to, just to follow up on that, um, what, uh, what type of uh, uh, enforcement measures are we talking about here? Is, is there a, a situation in which truancy becomes, you know, a kind of a reference to higher authority in this type of situation? Um, absolutely. But one thing that I would point out about um, attendance, the the thing that is most critical is the notion of chronic absenteeism. The truancy is part of the equation, but it's, it's a smaller part of the equation. So while we may have students that are truant, and that gets that is a separate uh, statutory I uh, issue, what we really focus on is regular good attendance, and that is um, that is not something that's that we can incentivize kids through punitive uh, actions. We really want them to be engaged in our schools. We want our parents back in our schools. They've been locked out of our schools for the past two years. It's been difficult. We want our um, parents to feel welcome. We want our students to be engaged in lessons. And we want to incentivize good attendance behavior. Uh, the research shows that being punitive really has no long-term lasting effects and we know our workforce in this community wants long-term lasting effects when it comes to showing up for a job. When you say chronic absenteeism, mm -hmm. is that correct? Can you just give an example of what that would be? It, the definition is missing as little as two days a month. 
So those add up. And that is the, really the definition of chronic absenteeism. How much do we have a situation of students are missing entire days, and how much of it is it they are either showing up late or leaving early? Well, in the high schools, what you just explained, the last uh, explanation you gave is more likely the case because they have several different classes during the day. So what we find there is sometimes they might play hopscotch which w with the classes that they come to and those that they might not come to. In the elementary uh, world, it's a little bit more about um, the whole day, but also showing up late is, is an issue. And so that counts as well. So it, really, we look at it by minute. That's how our state monitors attendance. So minute by minute counts. So the more students are here, the brighter their future is tomorrow. And that's just purely research-based. Does that include those leaving for games or practices? Um, students leaving for games or, and practices, while they uh, may not have those minutes, that is something that they're doing, which is extracurricular. And also, uh, anyone would tell you that keeps kids engaged in school, so they are not punished for being involved in activities or sports. And then finally, uh, would you say that, that the hopscotch factor, as you said, um, does that basically account for the slightly lower percentages that we were seeing at the high school level compared to the elementary school level? I think it was said something like some of the high schools were down in the 60s. Well, um, but that was in the past, and and really the the the. Um, pattern that we're seeing now post uh, or as a result of the impact of the pandemic is such that our 12th graders actually were starting to have uh, better attendance than our 8th graders. So it's, it's that 7th grade and that 8th grade and going into 9th grade that we are critically concerned about because in 9th grade, if you are missing out on time, you're missing out on credits and that starts to matter very quickly and so we really have to stabilize that group of our students. A lot of this is covered as you go through the teacher education programs in college. It's good practices. It's greeting kids at the door, having routines and procedures in place. Um, when we see that kid is struggling, we pull that kid and we may do one-on-one -on -one help for that kid. Um, if we have a group of children who aren't doing well with a specific objective, then we would pull a small group. So a lot of those practices are well known. It's nothing, uh, it's really nothing new in education. I just feel like sometimes over the past few years, we've gotten distracted by the new bright and shiny um, program, and really what we need to do is get back to the basics of good teaching practices. My fault for that is, how did you guys decide to go back to the basics? I think we've been hearing that from teachers for a really long time, that we have too many pots on the stove, and when you have too many pots on the stove, you're not really cooking anything. So. Our job is really to kind of go back and reevaluate all the programs that we are um, have in place right now and, and what's really going to give us the most bang for our buck. And some of those things that we're doing, like I said, when you have that many things going on, your focus is distracted. So we just really need to get back to the good uh, practices in education. Talk to anybody one-on-one. -on -one.